Good morning, sister, the jury members, teachers, and students. Now let's begin with the third segment of the competition. Firstly, I request the judges to send a photograph of the marking sheet to Ma'am Veena on a WhatsApp number. Now, we have a small entertainment session for all of you. Jharu Lakshmi. Let's get ready for the second round of declamation competition, having the students of class 11s and class 12s as the contestants. Coming up first, we have Anagha Chahan of 11th Humanities representing Tagore House. Humanity. We should be more about the intention. No father would want his daughter to be married off into a Muslim family. This issue has gone so far, but the truth is that the borders on the map are not the problem. The borders in our heart are the practical purposes of life. People often tend to question, will there ever be peace across the community? But the question is not whether there will be peace across communities or not. The real question is how far are you willing to go in order to ensure peace across communities? We need to take control of the present. Only then will the future be secured. Secularism means separation of religion and state. In a secular nation, the government must stay out of the religious ambit completely. But how could the Indian courts recognize Sharia-based Muslim laws claiming to be secular? How could the Indian government take over the management in the temples if they were secular? Over 10,000 people have been killed in the Hindu-Muslim riots. 
the slogans that had been raised for the demolition of Bari Chit had been flung like buttons planted by lynch mobs with the police simply watching? Is this the kind of secularism we want? Does secularism mean ruthless killings, protests and abductions all in the name of religion? What is the point of having a civilization if we cannot practice being civilized enough? We need to understand that it's okay to disagree on certain issues, but what's not okay is to hate each other because we disagree. These actions and many more fall outside the remit of a secular nation. The fact is that the Indian brand of secularism never discouraged religiosity. If anything, the Indian government has been guilty of doing is too much in promoting a culture towards socialism and the preamble. Just contrary since the word socialism is not defined in the constitution, its interpretations vary to suit different situations. Socialism stands for the welfare state, which most proactively uplifts its citizens of power. India and me can have a conversation about the kind of socialism and secularism was. Maybe it will end up being a version where people from different religious communities send their representatives to the parliament in order to arrive at a consensus. But this is a discussion we need to have as a people. And in the current circumstances, when there is panic amongst India's minorities, that India will turn or has already turned into a Russia, this is an urban discussion. Again, I would like to conclude by saying that should be considered the vortices loose in your knots and ma'am am I audible? Uh, yes, speak out. Sir, I've uh, said my speech. Was I not audible? It was not audible. I think now it's audible. You'll have to speak again, better. Turn on your uh, mic only and turn off your video. I think uh, your signal strength is very low. Okay, sir. Sir, am I audible now? Yes. Sir, am I audible? Yes, yes. Humanity, that's the title we should be most attached to. Yet, that's the title we are least attached to. I'm going to speak on the topic, current issues of secularism and socialism. We say that India is a secular nation. Yet, when a Muslim sits next to us, in his bed and his cap. We are often apprehensive of his intentions. Whenever we talk about marriage, the father would want his daughter to be married off into a Muslim family. This issue has gone so far that a Muslim delivery boy who was just doing his duty was sent back because of the fact that the Hindu could not accept food from a Muslim delivery boy. We often discuss and debate about the issues on the border, but the truth is that the borders on the map are not a problem. The borders in our heart are. Equality is only prevalent in the law, not the practical purposes of life. People often tend to question, will there ever be peace across communities? But the question is not whether there will be peace across communities or not. The real question is, how far are you willing to go in order to ensure peace across communities? We must fight for an alive future, not for a dead past. Secularism means separation of religion and state. In a secular nation, the government must stay out of the religious ambit completely. But how could the Indian courts recognize Sharia-based Muslim laws claiming to be secular? How could the Indian government take over the management of Hindu temples? if they were secular. 
Over 10,000 people have been killed in the Hindu-Muslim riots. The slogans that had been raised for the demolition of Babri Masjid had been flung like weapons chanted by lynch mobs with the police simply watching. Is this the kind of secularism we want? Does secularism mean ruthless killings, protests and abductions, all in the name of religion? What is the point of having a civilization if we cannot practice being civilized enough? We need to understand that it's okay to disagree on certain issues, but what's not okay is to hate each other because we disagree. These and many more actions fall outside the nation. Truth is that the only thing the Indian government has been guilty of doing is too much religion in promoting a culture of competitive religiosity. Similarly, the word socialism added in the preamble to is controversial. Since the word socialism is not defined in the constitution, its interpretation vary to suit different situations. Socialism is for the welfare state, which most proactively uplifts its citizens from poverty. India needs to begin to have a conversation about maybe it will end up being a version where people from different religious communities send their representatives to the parliament in order to arrive at a consensus. But this is a discussion we need to have as a people and in the current circumstances when there is panic amongst India's minorities that India will turn or has already turned into a Hindu Rashtra. This is an urgent discussion. In the end, I would like to conclude by saying that peace should be considered the greatest We must fight for an alive future, not for a dead past. There is a cure to the war, what is You're not. Next, we have Anmol Jahan of Class 11 Humanities representing Shakespeare House. Embrace controversy. It gives you a platform. It's a teacher, a clarifier, and your friend, especially if you're trying to make changes. Good morning, respected principal ma'am, honorable judges, teachers, and my listeners. Today, I and Mol Chahan will be speaking on current issues of socialism and secularism. On 3rd January 1977, by 42nd Amendment, along with many other changes in Indian constitution, the words socialist and secular were added to the preamble. It is said that this amendment was the effect of personal political ambitions of former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi rather than welfare of people. It is also said that these words have been wrongly inserted as they have no clear and precise meaning. Even after 43 years of amendment, the issue continues whether these words should be removed or not. A plea has been filed in Supreme Court seeking to remove these words which it said is contrary to constitutional tenets as well as to historical and cultural theme of India. It further said the move is per se illegal as it violates the freedom of speech and expression and right to freedom of religion. In the preamble of Indian constitution, the word socialism is read as socialist, which means a political economic system that advocates state's ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. Basically, the main idea behind the term socialist is that exploitation and inequality would end and socioeconomic justice would be guaranteed to all. Similarly, a secular state pertains the idea of secularism, which means separation of religion from civic affairs. It is incorrect to think that it was only 42nd Amendment that incorporated the words socialist and secular into the preamble. It just made explicit in the preamble the provisions which were implicit in the body. The very own 
Sovereign Democratic Republic of India on 26 November 1949, not on 3rd January 1977, in emergency, contort into a socialist secular republic. I must tell you, no great advance has ever been made in science, politics, or religion without a controversy. When I give food to poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. As a matter of fact, socialism and secularism are mended into constitutional fabric. And any effort to erase these principles will fall conflicting with the basic doctrine structure that is used to ride over that is used to override constitutional amendments. It is embedded in the basic structure of the national book and is beyond the power of parliamentary majority to efface or concise. Humanity is inherent in socialist and secular framework of rights and directive principles. My definition of secularism is very clear. The sole religion of the government is nation first and the holy book is the constitution. Thank you. Coming up next is Bhumika Varma of 11 Humanities representing Nehru House. It is rightly said by the Dalai Lama that human use, population, and technology has led to that certain stage where Mother Earth does not accept our existence with silence. Good morning to one and all present here. Today, I, Bhumika Varma from Nehru House, find myself privileged to be speaking on the topic. Nature speaks in harsh tones. Listen before it's too late. Since several years, Earth is acting as a parent for us providing us with whatever we need. But what have we given back in return? We are destroying nature at an unprecedented rate, threatening the survival of a million species of animals and plants and our own future too. Our destruction to the biodiversity and ecosystem services have reached levels. The deforestation level is 1,60,000. Pollution level is increasing by 3.4% each year due to which it is estimated that 7 million people, 7 million people have to die annually because of our selfishness and greediness. We are not only harming the nature, but our own lives too. Back in olden times, the earth was filled with greenery. Beautiful trees and flowers filled the forest. The forest served as a home for so many species. The water in the rivers was so clean that one could see the fishes swimming in it. Our planet was clean and our planet was pure. But with the development of mankind, human beings slowly started destroying this earth. Human beings are acting as an infection. Pure evil is a man who seeks to enslave Mother Earth and then, then destroy every gift she has given pure of heart. Today, our nature is in great danger and we human beings are to be blamed for this. Our destruction is reaching levels. Destruction of nature is now becoming human's nature. But once destroyed, Nature cannot be replenished at any cost. When nature comes to speak, it does wonders. It tolerates a lot, but when it is out of tolerance, it speaks. And then we see that people die at high rate. Economy level gets down. And there comes a big full stop to the development. People say it's never too late. But I say that one day if we continue to do this, we have to cry 
and say that it's too late. I hope I have given you food for thought. And at last, I would like to rest my words with a short poem. Save nature. Save nature, learn to be brave. Trees are our gems. Don't cut their stems. Treat animals with care. Or one day, this earth will be bare. Save nature, learn to be brave. Thank you. Now, representing Mary Ward House, we have Barkat Banga of 11 Medical. Good morning, respected members of the jury, principal, staff, and students. Today, I, Barkat Banga, representing the Mary Ward House, am here to speak on the given topic, current issues of secularism and socialism. The terms secular and socialist were added to the preamble of the Indian constitution at the time of the Indira Gandhi government by the 42nd constitutional amendment. To understand the challenges that pop up in the way on secularism and socialism, it is a requisite to know what these terms actually stand for secular, meaning divorced from religion or having no religious basis. It is the term given to the ineffective role of religion in determining state policies, educational organization, and the like. It means that the state will show no bias to any religion. It bars state's tendency from discriminating on the basis of religion. It implies religious tolerance, and dissociation of the state from religion in any form, making it a completely personal choice. Moving on to the meaning of socialism. It is the organization of the means of production and distribution in such a way that they are owned by the community as a whole and used for the sake of common good. Coming to the topic for today, that is the challenges to secularism and socialism. I would like to take them up one at a time. Since I first spoke about the meaning of secularism, I would like to highlight the threats to it first. Secularism in India is not what it is shown to be. Though constitutionally, India is a religion neutral state, yet we see Indians so deep rooted in religion that they connect each and every aspect to it. It is no surprise in seeing the way politicians and leaders use religion as a means to secure votes. They fuse religion with politics to get maximum votes. Mob lynching is a fast rising threat to secularism. Hindu nationalism is accelerating. Issues like suspicion to cow slaughtering, etc., have made the state an adulterated state. Forced closure of slaughterhouses, compelling religious conversions, etc., have been a major cause for the destruction of the secular dream of our forefathers. The secular fabric of Indian polity is deteriorating because of the communal riots that are prevalent in several parts of the motherland. Moving forward, that is socialism. The aim of our forefathers, ancestors, constitution makers was that people should have bank accounts, fairer credit access, restriction of monopolies, reduction in equality, social, political, economic philosophy encompassing a range of social economic systems characterized by social ownership of means of production and workers. Unfortunately, which seems utopia. Cronyism, nepotism, investment, disinvestment based on patronage and not profit have made Indian socialism take the back seat. 
Just stating the issues being faced by Indian socialism and secularism is not enough. We as a nation need to unite and stand against corruption. Only if each one of us pledges to stop malpractices can we stop corruption. We don't mind paying a few hundreds where our work can be done faster. This fosters corruption. We need to understand that God created humans and humans created religion. Having said that, we should stop dividing ourselves along religious lines and further along caste lines. Keeping these simple yet important steps in mind, can we reach the true ideals of secularism and socialism as enshrined in the Constitution of India? Thank you. Coming up next is Samaira Mittan of 11 Humanities, representing Ashok House. May I have your attention, please? Goat Priya Malik. When a fish dies in the ocean and there is nobody there to see it, did it ever really die? When a tree falls in the forest and there is nobody there to hear it, did it ever really fall? When a hole forms in the ozone layer and there is nobody there to feel it, did it ever really fall apart? Good afternoon, honorable judges, respected principal and teachers, and my worthy listeners. Today, I, Smyra Mithin, student of Class 11 Humanities, representing the show house, am here to speak on the topic, Nature Speaks in Hushed Tones, Listen before it is too late. When I was as little as you, my mum would say, the sky was filled with stars. The grass was so clean and tidy. The trees who stood so high as the custodians of Mother Earth were almost everywhere to be found. And the air, ah, so fresh it was. And then she'd always sigh. My timid mind never really understood why. But now, 16 years old, wise and bold, I know why. In a world where the trees stand effortlessly binding the soil and selflessly spreading life, where the rivers flow flourishingly, where the sun shines vividly in the titanic sky, and that's nothing but love, care, and hope, an erratic, heedless organism was created, human being. Human being whose every breath signifies how both positive and negative aspects work together, just as we inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. Whose every cell spells unity and teamwork turned out to be a complete catastrophe. Whose every drop of blood was supposed to serve the nature. But it turns out that every perk of nature till now serves the existence of this being. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as of May 2020 is the highest it has been in human history. In India, we have 18 of the 25 most polluted cities in the world. Lately, air quality has led to flight cancellations, closed schools, park protests, but what it has not done yet is awaken us. Is it because I'm still breathing? Are you still breathing? Are we still breathing? In 2018, 1.2 million people died due to air pollution, which is 3,267 people every day, which is 134 people every hour. Why are our lives all about me, 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 and not all of us in this together? Why can't we for once not just learn that it is good to reduce the actually implemented? Why can't we see it is us and there is no other reason? Is it because I'm still breathing? Are you still breathing? Are we still breathing? Glaciers are melting, finite resources almost exhausted. Forests are dying. I swear to God, I'm not lying. We need to save our planet while we still can. So, quote Priya Malik. When a fish dies in the ocean and there is nobody there to see it, did it ever really die? Yes. 
When a tree falls in the forest and there is nobody there to hear it, did it ever really fall? Yes. When a hole forms in the ozone layer when there is nobody there to feel it, did it ever really fall apart? Yes. So please, for once, do not just mind your own business.